Christ. Glory I've been mentioning how we are in the season of the cross. Coming to the end of this season of the cross as we move into the nativity season. And all the readings of the gospel of, of the season of the cross are really for us to prepare for the second coming of our Lord. These are all warnings for us on, on, on good teachings for us how to live. We talked about the unjust steward and how it's important to make friends with the poor. We talked about the rich man and Lazarus and who are the Lazaruses in our lives while we're here on this earth that we need to be paying attention to. We talked about the rich fool, a person who was very rich, but Jesus looked at him and called him a fool because he used all his wealth just to make bigger barns and store it. Here, we have an encounter of a man who comes to Jesus, the rich young ruler. This man had three things. This, this, this gospel account is, is found in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This man had three qualities that we all would consider as very successful in today's standards. Number one, it says he was rich. He had a lot of money. We live in a society that gives importance to this. I was saying this in the sermon about Lazarus. We know all the rich people in the world, but we're, no, we're not familiar with the names of the poor. Our Lord looks at it opposite. And so he was very rich. Not only was he very rich, but he was young. It says he was young. We take a lot of, we put a lot of value to a person who makes money when they're young. It's one thing to work a job over 30 years, store that money, and get to an old age and have money. But it's another thing from a young age to make a lot of money and have this wealth. And the third thing is, he was young. We aspire for youth. We try to look as young as we can. We try to deny getting older, right? We don't embrace it. Right? We try to, try to look younger, as young as we can possibly look. That's what we try to do. So he was rich. He was young. And then also he had position. He was rich and young, but he also had position. He was a ruler. He was somebody in the community. Somebody who, if you're a ruler, you have people under you. So he was a person with position. Something that we all in, in this society give respect to. He was a person who was young and he was a person who was rich. All in today's, in the world standards, success story. But you look and see, he had the richness, he had the youth, he had the position, but he was still empty. He was still not satisfied with that. There was something in him that said, I have all these things, but I need more. And he goes to Jesus, having all these things, knowing that there's something good about Jesus. And he goes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Which is a beautiful question that many of us aren't even thinking. We're just thinking about this life. But he goes to the, to, to the Lord and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? A great, great question that we should be thinking of. And I was thinking about, as we're raising a new generation, and as we are going through life ourselves, we need to think of, to ourselves as to, what are we satisfied with in our life? What is going to bring us true satisfaction? Because the story of this man is telling us, position won't do it, wealth won't do it, and even just being a young person won't do it. So there are things that are lacking, the emptiness that we have to acknowledge in our lives. There was a book that was written about 20 years ago, but I think it still applies today. It says it's called The American Paradox. And it talked about how America, just this country of America, has never seen as much wealth as it has seen in these past decades. That there are so many people that the standards of living have gone up and up and up. And the, the, but at the same time, with all of this wealth, the paradox is that there's still a lot of problems going on in the world, in our society. The divorce rates are still high. 
increased cohabitation without marriage, depression, anxiety, loneliness. And this, oftentimes this loneliness may lead to anger, thoughts of self-harm, or harm towards others. That's why, you know, I, I always think about when I'm with our kids, I think about how when I was a kid, we could go outside so freely. And now I think we always try to keep track of our kids, eyesight of our kids. Kwachama says, I don't do the best job of that. But still, you know, we try the best we can to, to keep an eye on our kids because we're so concerned of what's going on in the world. There's this anxiety and, and, and this, this concern of how the world is not a safe place anymore because of these problems. And the book's premise is that we are, though that we are rich, we are spiritually poor. And this is leading to this state in the society that we need to pay attention to. And so the question I think we need to ask ourselves is, what must I do to be spiritually rich? To be satisfied? To be having the Lord's peace and comfort in my life? And the church teaches us, we must purif be purified of the sin in our life. It's a personal, internal journey journey that we must do that we must do and the first there are two things I want us to think about and to, to, to grow in spiritual richness and to be purified of our sin the first thing we have to do is to develop humility it says about this rich young ruler that he goes before Jesus he knelt before him he bowed before him he humbled himself and he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He asked that question. He humbled himself before someone. And it's very important for us to think, what must I do to be able to humble myself before the Lord to even ask that question? To be at a place of humil humility. There was a man in the fourth century. He was in church. His parents had just passed away, but left him a great inheritance, a lot of money for him and his sister who was uh, his younger sister. He heard this same gospel passage in the church. And he heard it and he, and he, and he took it to his heart. He put, he, he put his sister in the care of some nuns and then he took all of that inheritance and gave it to the poor and then he ran, ran off into the desert. And this man is known in the church today as St. Anthony. And St. Anthony is the father of the monastic movement. Inspired by people like John the Baptist, he left everything in the world and went into the desert and started to pray and develop a community there of people who were totally devoted to this journey of spiritual purification and of prayer. And, it's very, and I bring this up to talk about the Desert Fathers they're known as the desert fathers in the church. Because one of the things that would commonly happen is when a person comes into the monastery, and if there's an abbot, or an, uh, which is the leader of the monastery, or a spiritual father, they would go to the person, and they would just say this. They go, Abba, give me a word. In other words, he's saying, give me something I need for my salvation. Anything you tell me, I will use it and, and, and do it. To grow in my spiritual life. That's the humility that we have to, to get to. And notice in the scripture, in, in, the, in the gospel account of Mark, of this same passage, it says, Jesus looked at him and then gave him this advice. He looked at him. The same way, when Jesus looks at us, he can see us better than we can see ourselves. He can see the filth in our hearts. He can see the things that are lingering there that we need to be purified of in order to grow in spiritual richness. And you may say, well, I'm not in a monastery. I don't have a spiritual father like that, where, that, that I can go to uh, uh, on a daily basis. But I would encourage you to think of your family life as an arena to grow in spiritual purity. I would encourage you to look at your spouses, to look at your children, to look at your parents as people who can help you to see where you need to be better in your spiritual life. They can help you to see where you need to grow in patience and in love and in humility. But we have to be ready to receive that word from our loved ones. 
To see it from our loved ones and say that. There has to be a humility there. Oftentimes in family life, because we don't understand God's plan in it, when we are brought up with our faults or something we can do better, we get defensive. We say, who is this person to say this? What about this, this, and this? And we get defensive. But the spirit of humility says, this is coming from God. God has brought these people in my life. Our family is not something that we often choose. It's people that our children, our parents. Our family life is not often something that we know all about. But there's a divine mystery in it. Just like there's people called to a monastic life. People are in a family life. Many of us, or more of us, are in family life. With parents, with brothers and sisters, with children, with spouses. And God is bringing those people in to help us to purify ourselves of the sin that we cannot see, but they can be the mirror for us, but we have to humi- humble ourselves for that. So the first thing is humility. The second thing, the second thing, and this is from the pers- point of view of the person who's giving the advice. It says what I love, I, this account in, 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 in Mark's uh, gospel, It says this, it says, Jesus looked at him, loved him, and then says, sell all you have and give to the poor. He loved him. In his love, he's telling him these things. So we have to ask ourselves whether we're a parent, whether we're a child or a brother or sister, whether we're a Sunday school teacher, whether we are a spouse, we have to ask ourselves, is what I'm saying Rooted in love. Is my love coming across when I'm saying these things to someone, when I'm trying to counsel someone? Do they know that I love them? That is a hard thing to always be conscious of. But this is something that we have to understand. Many times in anger we say things like this. But we are called to love and to help each other on the journey towards the kingdom. I was telling our, in our Sunday school teachers retreat, I said, your job is not just to teach them information, to teach the students information. Because I, I can tell you, as a child grows serious in his, his or her faith, he can find all, or she can find all the information that is needed. But your, your job is to love the children, to love them, and they should know that you love them and that you are there to teach them because you love them. And the things that you are telling them about the kingdom of God, about the Lord, about the church, are there so that they can live fulfilling lives in spiritual richness and not be like this rich young ruler who had everything but was empty. And sometimes I think we we, we think we have to wait till we're an old age to realize these things. It's not the case. We should know it now. The rich young ruler... We don't know what happened. We know that he walked away sad. The scriptures don't tell us whether he ever decided to follow this advice or not. That that we don't know. It doesn't say. We know uh, he walked away sad because he was rich. But sometimes it takes time for us to take in the advice of, of, of our loved ones or to take in the corrections that we need to make. The purification is a journey in itself. And so don't expect overnight changes either. Be patient with one another in our spiritual growth. Know that as long as God has given us breath and life on this earth, there's always a chance to grow in repentance. There's always a chance to turn from sin. There's always a chance to grow in love and in humility. These are the things I want us to meditate on this week. The humility that it takes to receive counsel, to look for that counsel and and take that counsel as counsel from God. But at the same time, the love that we must emphasize when we give counsel, whether it be to whoever it may be, do they know, are we investing in the people and showing them we love them? Or are we always just saying critical words? There's a difference. And these are the things that we can learn to grow in spiritual richness. May all glory be to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and always, forever and ever. Amen.